Now, don't let, some of the, don't let the idea of getting up and messing up stop you from singing. I'm trying to encourage folks to get together and get some hymns and get up here and sing because we're still not trying to do the singing thing because we don't want everybody spitting on everybody and that kind of a deal. So we're, we're trying to do some things so you can't look back and say, I'm sick because of the church. You know, we're trying to, trying to be safe along those lines, but uh, we do want to encourage some of you to maybe sing some hymns and things like that. And we appreciate that special. I'm glad that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. That's a story that never, it never gets old. You can uh, talk about it, preach about it, sing about it in all kind of different ways. And the love of God is truly amazing. And thank God for that. Let's open our Bibles, if you have your Bible, to Psalm 30. Psalm 30. If you'd like to stand with us as we read, we'll read the entire psalm. It's only 12 verses. Psalm 30. You'll notice the heading of the psalm in Psalm 30 says, A psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David. So that's the context if you remember, when David got established in the land, the Bible tells us that Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So he was able to build his own house, and of course he had a great house as any king would. And then later on he says, you know, I dwell in a house of cedars, and the Lord's house is just this tabernacle. And then God put it in his heart to begin to gather and collect the material to build the temple. But before there was a grand temple under Solomon, David had a house. And this psalm is a song that David wrote in looking back at God's blessings as he dedicated his house. That's probably where people get that. I've had some people that wanted me to pray as they got a new home <coughs> over their house. There's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing wrong. You get a new home, first thing you ought to do is get down and get the Bible and get your family and thank God for the place and ask God to move in. Amen. Ask the Lord to move in before you move in. And so that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think that's the context of this passage as David looks back and asks for God's blessings. Look in verse number 1, Psalm 30, verse 1. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me, Lord. Be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing, Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time we can open up this blessed book together. Lord, we do thank you for the blessings of life. We thank you for eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. Lord, if it, if it were not for the old rugged cross, if it, if it were not for Calvary and what you did for us, Lord, none of us would be here. We wouldn't have the assurance of salvation. We wouldn't know that even though life may fall apart, we have a home in heaven. We have a place laid up for us. We have everlasting life that can't be taken away. Lord, thank you for that assurance. And Lord, we do pray, as has already been said in the testimonies, if there's somebody here that doesn't have that assurance, we pray they would get that today, that they would know beyond any shadow of a doubt, that they're saved, that their sins have been forgiven. Lord, help them to make that decision to trust Christ if they've never done so. And Lord, for us as believers, I pray that you'd strengthen us in our faith as we walk through the valley of life. God, I pray you'd use this passage, this scripture, to give us something to feed on. Lord, we are not just physical beings, we are spiritual beings, and we need spiritual food. 
God, I pray that you might sustain us and feed us with the Word of God now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. You know, when you think about it, come down to verse number 11, if you will. As David looks back over the trials and troubles of life, he thanks God. As opposed to looking back over the trials and troubles of life and being bitter. Instead of being bitter, he was blessed. And he looks back, even though bad things had happened, even though he had some very rough spots, and some of it even caused himself, amen, Amen. he can finally say in verse number 11, Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. Look at this. And girded me with gladness. I think the Lord wants us to be girded with gladness. There are several conversions here in this passage I really want to look at, and that will really be my points uh, when we talk talk about this theme. But you'll see different things as you work through the passage. The anger turning into favor, the weeping turning into joy, all these things throughout this. But first and foremost, as we talked about some in our testimonies here this morning, the most important conversion is a conversion of a soul to Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. Uh, life is uh, without Jesus Christ is really just a uh, just just a vanity of vanities. And Paul preached about conversion, and he says over in Acts chapter number fifteen, the Bible says they speaking of Paul and the preachers here, they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And salvation and conversion is not a process. And if you study anything in American history, you study the great American awakenings, the moving of God in the the spiritual revivals, what you had with what we call evangelicalism when you study the great awakening is this idea that the cross of Jesus Christ brings a radical change to a sinner. And it's not this process of I've been born and christened into the church and now I'm a Christian because I've been baptized as a baby. By the way, there is no baptism of a baby anywhere in the Bible. We're Baptists. And by the way, I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred. You know when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. You get that. But this idea of baptizing a baby and now they're in the church is not in the Bible. And if your doctrine is not in the Bible, I can tell you where it can to put it in. The trash can. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't belong in the church. Well, you know, we're just believing that we're receiving people in the family of God, and then as they grow up later on, they'll be converted. That's a bunch of hogwash. What it produces is people in the church that have never been converted. Now, you might be in the church, you might come here, but if you've never, you say, well, I want to join the church. Okay, well, have you ever joined Jesus Christ? If you're not saved... You can't be a member of the church. You say, you're going to exclude people? Absolutely. By the way, if you're a pervert, you're automatically excommunicated. It's in our bylaws. If all of a sudden you get twisted and you turn into a pervert, you're not a member of our church anymore. You can't come in here and vote for some sodomite to sit on the board. Amen. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I don't care what the flag says. I don't care what patriotism says. The Bible trumps any type of leadership in our country. And it ought to trump any type of leadership in your church. There's no Bible baptism for babies. Conversion is when a sinner consciously knows, as Brother Jeff testified, he knew he was bad and he was a sinner and Jesus Christ could save him. That's the beginning of conversion. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're born again. And this is not some type of process to where it takes a while. I understand the birthing process is a process. I get that. I understand that there's labor and travail. And I understand that a sinner goes through some things when they're understanding about their own sin. The hard part is to get people lost, not to get them saved. The process is for them. The repentance part's the hard part. You say, what does that have to do with? Quitting all this stuff? No. That has to do with repenting of who you are, a dirty, low-down, rotten sinner. And you've got to realize that. And that sometimes can be a tough thing for proud Americans especially. Because we think we are somebody. We think we are entitled and privileged and we have rights and how dare you do this and do that. How dare you step on my property? Don't pay the property tax and see if it's really your property. Don't put a tag on your car and see if it's really your car. Well, we just have all these freedoms. Okay, we'll go down that road later on. 
<laughs> you got two rights. You got a right to die and a right to face judgment. Yeah. Well, I don't, don't the Bible say all men are created equal? Uh, I never found that. Read it five times a year for 20-something years. Nope. Don't get me off on that. You need a conversion. If you, when we talk about all these other things, they are, they are secondary if you've never had a conversion. If you've never met Jesus Christ and been translated from darkness to light, if you've never met Jesus Christ and been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, out of Satan's hold to God's fold, you've never been saved. You need to understand you're not going to hell anymore. You've been saved from hell. Now you're going to heaven and you not only are headed for death, but now you have everlasting life. Man, there's a big change. We were pardoned as a sinner, and now we're adopted as God's son. I was outside of God's family, now I'm in God's family. I was lost, now I'm found. And thank God for the conversion of a sinner. Now, many things in our Christian life are a process, however. We grow. Growth is a process. Look at these little kids and some of them we hadn't seen because they hadn't been able to come with all the stuff going on. Then you see them and you're like, man, they done grown three and four inches. And then some of you, you know, you're putting on the COVID pounds. <laughs> You've been eating a little extra Twinkies and chocolate and everything else, you know, and uh, I, I get that. I understand that. I don't know if the peach place is still open, but I had me some good homemade peach Georgia ice cream a couple weeks ago. I might have been sick for three days, but it was worth it. So what size did you get? Do you have to ask? There's only one size, large. But a lot of things are a growth, and you see growth with kids and all that kind of stuff. And as the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word that you may grow thereby. So there are some processes in our Christian life. And I want us to look at some of these uh, conversions here, some of this idea of being girded with gladness. How do we get to the place to where finally at the end David says, I'm girded with gladness. With all the stuff that's happened, I can still say I'm glad. My attitude is still of gratitude. Even though I've done all these things, had all this stuff happen, I still have joy. Man, that's a successful Christian life. When you get to the end of this thing, instead of being bitter, you're better. Man, that's a successful Christian life. All right, let's look at it. Notice verses 2 and 3, we notice from sickness to health. First of all, David had something going on here. He says in verse number 2, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave, kept me alive. Physical sickness. I believe David had something going on, and obviously God healed him. And you know, there's a lot of people that have had physical sickness that we've prayed for, and they haven't gotten healed. And I try to preach the Bible uh, the right way, which I believe is dispensationally. And when you understand the Bible rightly divided, you'll understand we're not living in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right. We're not living in the earthly ministry of Christ where the signs, wonders, and miracles, nobody ever died around Jesus Christ. Like the guy you heard about the young preacher trying to figure out how to uh, do a funeral. He says, well, I'm just going to go and find out how the Lord Jesus performed funeral ceremonies. And he read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and found out Jesus didn't ever do funerals. All he did was resurrections. <laughs> Nobody ever died around Christ, and anybody who was sick around Christ, he healed them. But he does not do that in the same way that he did then. Go break your arm. You say, what are you going to do? You're not going to ask God to heal it. You're going to go to the doctor. Now, thank God for the doctor. The Bible says pray about everything, so pray about it. Lord, help me not to get a ticket as I'm going 100 miles an hour to go get, go get this bone put back in here. Lord, help the doctors, give them wisdom. I pray the medicine would work. These unseen things that we don't understand and as far as medicine is concerned, God, we put these in your hands. I'm not telling you not to pray about it, but I'm not telling you to be stupid either and get out of your dispensation and get into a place to where you're expecting to God do something he never told you he was going to do in the first place. So I, believe, I just believe God does everything just like he did in the book of Acts. I don't know what you've been smoking this morning, but you need to stop it. Somebody doesn't agree with the gospel, okay, let's go up to them after service and I want you to make them blind. Paul had the power to do that. Somebody who dies, let's go raise them up from the dead. Let's go to another country with ever, never having learned the language and start speaking that language. That's the book of Acts. 
It's not happening now. And so what happens is in this age, I believe of all ages, we are having our faith tested because we are so experience driven because of Americans. I think we're just, everything's got to be experienced and we're not able to back up and say, you know, the Bible settles my faith issue because I have faith in the facts and whether God does something for me physically or not, I'm still going to be girded with gladness because I still know God's good. I still know God loves me. I still know God has a plan for me, whether I get healed or whether I stay sick. Amen. Yeah. Now, thank God, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more sorrow. Thank God for that. Yeah, it right. says, neither will there be any more pain. Yeah. Some of you, not just during this crisis, you know, it's a little bit of a risk now to come to church. I mean, it is. You don't know what's going to happen. But some of you, for years, some of the older folks especially, you have got up with pain and you've come to church in pain because you wanted to sacrifice that to actually be here. I, I think the Lord sees that stuff. Some of you deal with pain on a daily basis. Are you girded with gladness? Do you in everything give thanks? If not, you know what's going to happen? The gladness is going to turn into a grudge. You're going to think, God, why don't you take this away? There's other people just like me, same age, same circumstances. They're not in pain, but I'm in pain. Why me? Why does this happen? Why do I always have to go to the quack doctors? Why do I always get to bad doctors? Why do I always get this? Why always that? Instead of being girded with gladness, you're girded with grumbling and murmuring and complaining and bitterness. I'm telling you, one day the pain's going to be done. It might not be done in this life. Now, if God takes away in this life, I hope he does. The Bible says we need to consider one another as being in the body with them. You have a bad pain, you have sickness, I'm going to pray for you to get better. And if I get sick, I want you to pray for me to get better. But it doesn't always happen that way. I was reading about some art. There was uh, these two artists, very well-renowned years ago. And one of them was about 30 years younger than the, the other guy. It was kind of like his mentor. And uh, they would get together and and talk art, and sometimes even paint together. And uh, this older artist, he had come down with the rheumatoid arthritis and just debilitating and so forth. But the younger artist would go over there and sit with him. He'd be painting, and he would just be wincing with every stroke. And finally, the younger guy asked him, says, look, why don't you just stop? You do not, you've got all these masterpieces. You've done all this stuff for 50 years. Why don't you just stop? He says, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. You know, your pain is going to pass. You want to get some relief, right? God's going to give you some relief one day. Now, there's a worse sickness than physical sickness. Isaiah chapter 1, he talks about the nation of Israel being covered with sores, bruises, and wounds, and putrefying sores. He said, the whole head is sick. And then the whole heart is faint. There's a sickness in the head that can affect the heart. And I think spiritual sickness is one of the worst things. But here's the thing about that. The spiritual sickness can also be healed. And I believe as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to understand that sometimes even your physical pain can affect your spiritual life. You are a tripart being. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And sometimes if you're not careful, your physical condition can affect your spiritual life. And so you want to be careful with that. And so when you have spiritual sickness... We need to go to the Lord with that. He mentions that in the book of Revelation. Actually, he says, you, you're so sick, you're making me sick, God says. Talk about spreading disease. The church can make Christ sick. And he says, you need to, you need to take this, this healing medicine that I have. We need to take God's medicine. What is your attitude when you have that thorn in the flesh? When you have that thorn, that pain, that, that problem that you've prayed and prayed for God to remove and He doesn't remove, what's your attitude? Let's look at the next one here. Look at verse number 5. 1 
For his anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The first part of the verse, his anger endureth but a moment. So we have a change from sickness to health. Here we have from anger to favor, because he says, in his favor is life. Here's what I want you to get, a couple of things here. First of all, the reality of chastisement. God does, regardless of what the world and modern Christianity has pushed out there, God does get mad. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ got mad. The Bible says he looked on them with anger. Mark chapter 3, I think it is. Whenever they, they didn't want him to heal the guy with a withered hand. One place or two places, the Bible tells us at the beginning of his ministry and the end of his ministry, he took a cord and made a whip and he drove the people out of the temple that were selling the, uh, the items and wares in the temple. They were making profit on the sacrifices. He drove them out of there. God does get angry. You say, does God get angry with his children? Parents, do you ever get angry with your children? Don't look at me like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son, and he receiveth. There's the reality of chastisement, but then there's the reaction to chastisement. How do we respond to God's anger? You can either take it as a burden or a blessing. Notice in verse number 7, he makes the statement, Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. There's another passage, I think it's, I'll read it to you in Psalm 10. He makes the statement, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Have you ever gone through things in life and it just feels like the Lord is not there? Now, if you're saved, He's inside of you. We know that from the Bible's teaching. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. But you don't always feel Him. Sometimes He's pulled back. And why does He pull back? As far as chastisement is concerned, he pulls back because we've pushed him back. God is not a big kiss in the sky. He's not a big grandpa in the sky or grandma that just says, you know, you're kin, so I love you no matter what. That's not the attitude, the right attitude of God's love. God is holy. You see that also in the passage in verse number um, 4. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints, if he have give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. How, how often do we thank God for being holy and pure? You see all the impurity in our society today? It's just wicked. Don't you appreciate purity? Aren't you, isn't it good to come to church and you know you're not going to hear any boom, boom music in here? <laughs> boom. Stuff's out of hell, man. It's almost as bad as some of the country music y'all listen to. <laughs> Just wickedness. The junk on the TV all the time. The, the, just the, some of the stuff is just, it's just godless. It's good to come and you don't have to worry about that here. Some of you have to deal with things at work. You have to listen to the world's music just because of your work environment. I get that. You're hanging around people. They're throwing out the F-bombs and all this other junk. Just throw out a Jesus bomb. But you know, it's good to know that God is pure and He's holy. That's one reason I get so mad about people that corrupt the Bibles because the Bible is the only thing you have on this earth that's pure. Yeah. But the reality of chastisement is that God is holy and God is good and God is just and therefore we offend God and that puts us at odds with God. So if God's going to get us back to Him, He's got to chasten us to wake us up because we're so stubborn. And it's, it's kind of like you see it with children. If they don't have some pain inflicted on them, it doesn't get their attention. How many times in their prosperity, like David says, I shall not be moved, how many times in prosperity do people really thank God and go around praising God? Oftentimes in prosperity, they just revel in the flesh. They just enjoy their prosperity. It takes pain to get man's attention. It takes trouble to get people to look up. That's just how we are. But here's what I want you to really see. 
and hopefully be a blessing to you here in this verse. His anger endureth but a moment, and His favor is life. God loves you, and God's point in punishing you is not to see you hurt or to suffer or to laugh at you or to make fun of you or to push you further away. In His favor is life. God favors life. And He wants you to get better as a result of it. I think sometimes we don't see that as far as the chastening process. The Lord wants us to go ahead and learn the West. Here's what He'll do first. He'll give you the Word of God. He'll say, Thou shalt not, and He'll give you the Scripture. He'll have a preacher say it, or He'll have it as you read your Bible. He'll reprove you. He'll rip you up one side and down the other. That's why, by the way, you need to be reading the Bible. So God can reprove you with His words. Because if you don't use the words, it's kind of like, Hey, take out the trash. Okay, things go on, blah, 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 minutes, hours pass. Take out the trash. Number two. He says it again, says it again. Finally, words aren't going to do it. If you're not in His Word and you're not receiving the reproof and correction from His Word, He had to pull off the belt. And He will get you to move. God knows how to move you. So I'm pretty stubborn. You ain't too stubborn for God. God can move you. But here's the thing. Anger can be turned to favor because it only endureth but a moment. God's chasing you and God's maybe putting you through that not because He hates you but because He loves you. He's disciplining you to try to make you better. And He's correcting you to bring you to a place that you need to be. And it will be better after it's over. He chastens us for His pleasure and for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness, He tells us in Hebrews. And so I hope that you understand that. Behind God's mercy is His holiness. Behind His holiness is His compassion. Micah chapter 7 verse 18, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of His heritage? He retaineth not His anger forever, he do, because He delighteth in mercy. Psalm 130, he says, Lord, if thou shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. If God really held you accountable for every single thing and really pulled off the belt every time he should have, man, we'd always be behind the woodshed. I know I would. God is merciful. And this chastisement you might be going through this Reproof you might be going through is but for a moment. In His favor is life. God wants you to come out better on the other end of that. He's not going to go to all the effort to chasten you, to discipline you, to send you through that trial for no reason at all. His mercies fail not. Thank God for that. Now look at verse number 5 as well. He says, not only does His anger endure, but a moment in His favor is life. I guess that says God's pro-life right there, right? Amen. He likes life, not death. Don't you like life? All these people killing people and all this kind of stuff. Death. Entertainment is all about killing somebody. How come you can't be entertained by something that doesn't involve death? God likes life. But look at the last part of verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh into the morning. The Lord wants to turn your weeping to joy. You ever cried... When you couldn't cry anymore, there were, the, the tear ducts were dry. There was just no, there was nothing that was left. The emotions were wrenched out. You were just wiped out physically. Weeping and sorrow, not just sorrow because of sickness, but sorrow, emotional sorrow. We're not just mindless animals walking around. Animals don't get their feelings hurt. Maybe if you pull up your hand, you're about to slap them upside the head. Get out of here, dog. But you can say, I love you so much! They're still going to tuck their tail. They're not stricken by words of emotion. But you are. Somebody can come up and say, you about as ugly as sin. And you'll get your feelings hurt. They can talk about you. And you'll go get a lawyer. That's what you do nowadays, right? You get offended and go get a lawyer and try to sue somebody and take everything they have. And if they give you an inch, you're going to take a, you know, give them an inch, they'll take a ruler and become the ruler. Amen. That's the modern age. But the fact of the matter is, you have sorrow and you have weeping and you have times in life when you are hurt to the soul. 
times of loss. Or you lose someone that's close to you. Sometimes your dreams just dissipate like the morning fog. They're gone. You had it all planned out. You thought God was blessing you. You thought God was behind it. You thought it was all going to work out this way. And it doesn't. The end of 2019, getting up into 2020, we had everything planned out for 2020, right? <laughs> God can turn our weeping into joy. Psalm 126, he says in verses 5 and 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There's a delay of joy, obviously at night time. Weeping may endure for a night. Notice the contrast. You have weeping contrasted with joy, but you have night contrasted with mourning. The Bible presents this time in which we're in as a dark period. The church age is presented and typified as nighttime. Paul says, they, he says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness. So Paul's like, look, we're in the church age, it's a dark time. The world is wicked and the churches even are going into apostasy. The, the lights are low. But that means the morning's right around the corner. One good thing about night is morning's coming. There hadn't been a day that I've lived that the sun hadn't risen up. You ever have just an awful evening or night? Maybe you wake up in a panic and you have all these fears and all these things happening to you. Maybe in the middle of a night and you just get through the night and then that sun comes up and then you get a little bit of coffee in you. That helps. Uh, and then you get your Bible. Never drink coffee without reading your Bible, amen. And you get your Bible and you get your coffee and the sun's coming up and things just look different when the, the shadows aren't long. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm telling you, there's a delay of joy. The disciples, they're out on the sea in the fourth watch of the night, the last watch. What happens? Here comes Jesus. I think we're at the last watch. I hope we are. Sometimes we wander in the dark so we can learn how to lean on Jesus because you can't see well. So that's why I said this is the age which our faith really has to be tested. So I really want to know God's real. Okay, I'm going to go walk on the water and I'll know God's real. I really want to go know God's real. I'm going to have a miracle. You really want to know God's real? Believe the Bible. Amen. Live by faith, not by sight. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and he shall direct thy paths. He'll let you go in the dark so you can learn to lean on him. When it's light, you're not leaning on Jesus. You're just going along thinking you got it all figured out. But when it's dark, you learn to lean on him. And you know, some things can be seen in the darkness you can't see in the light. You know, you can really, you look up, you go out here, you're looking up, you're looking in the ionosphere, stratosphere, what all, of, all the other fears are out there. <laughs> you're looking up there and you're only seeing so far. But man, when that darkness comes, you're looking billions of light years. You're looking into the past. It's amazing how far you can see at night. It's amazing how the sound travels at night and how you can hear at night. You get in that darkness, you might can hear the Lord a little better. There's a delay of joy, but then there's a day of joy. Your morning will come. Jesus Christ is our joy, by the way. He is our hope, by the way. The Bible says the disciples came out and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And our day is coming. The joy is coming in the morning. And it may not be an earthly day. It may not be a day right around the corner here. And if you're thinking November is going to be the greatest time in the world, well, we're either going to be on one side or the other. And if, if, if all your hope is in politics and all your hope's just in elections and all your hope's just in national prosperity for the United States, that's a very dim, dim outlook. Amen. That's right. My hope is not in this world. My hope's in the world to come. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Joy's coming in the morning. Luther Bridges was an American pastor. He was a Methodist preacher back, born in like 1830s. And um, he actually, I was looking him up. He wrote the song, He Keeps Me Singing. I'll give you a verse out of that in a second. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll give you a verse out of it. We sing it in our hymn book. He actually he pastored down here in Perry, Florida at one of the Methodist churches there years ago. 
late 1800s, early 1900s, about 1909, I think he pastored there. But he became a pretty popular revival preacher, and he traveled up in different areas, and he also obviously wrote hymns and so forth. Uh, he was married, and he had a wife with three boys, three young boys. He was preaching up in Kentucky because his wife was visiting. As he was preaching, she was visiting her parents up in Kentucky where she was from. And while he was preaching away from home, they had a house fire there. You know how a lot of times in old homes without electricity and so forth, fires could get started like that. And his wife and three boys all perished in the fire. Rumor has it, and of course sometimes you don't know how to validate these stories as they come down as to when he actually wrote the song. But he did write this song, He Keeps Me Singing, and we sing it. Here's one of the verses, and I thought about this as I thought about, here's this guy serving God with his life, surrendered with his life. His wife surrendered. Love God, serve God. What does God let happen? Next time you get worried about what God's letting happen in your life, look and see what he let happen to his son. Look and, let, look and see what he let happen to Paul, the greatest New Testament Christian. He says, Paul, I'm not going to take your thorn away. By the way, I'm going to push it in a little harder. By the way, you're going to sacrifice your life on the chopping block. Look what he let happen to John. Well, John got to have the great revelation. Uh, do you know how John got that revelation? He was arrested and put on a desert island. He was on Gilligan's Island there. <laughs> he was on the island of Patmos. And then tradition has it that they took him and boiled him alive. So here's this preacher back in the early 1900s, wife, three kids, serving God, doing great work. What does God let happen? House fire. But he wrote this, Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way, though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Imagine somebody going through that. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. I like the last verse. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Your weeping is going to turn to, to, to rejoicing one day. Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. When he went to that tomb of Lazarus, the Bible says two little words, and I'm glad those words are in there. Jesus wept. You get this idea from social media that every time you take a picture, you you know should look like Joel Osteen. You know, <laughs> is today a Friday for you? Every day is a Friday for me. I don't know how I can preach from my face like this all the time, but I know that I'm successful, and I know that everybody needs to give their money to me so you can be as happy as I am. How do you live with a smile on your face like that all the time? Sometimes life sucks you in the gut. And you got to weep for a while. But you need to be girded with gladness in the sadness. How in the world can you do that? I think the key to this whole thing is the attitude even before you go through trials. You need to know about God and then you need to know God. Notice in verse number 11, he turns the morning to dancing. I'm glad there's going to be a day of rejoicing. We're going to get to heaven. First thing that's going to hit you is like, man, I'm really here. <laughs> the rapture's going to have that trumpet's going to sound. I don't know how it's going to go. And we've all postulated and talked about it, you know. It says at the last trump, maybe there'll be a series of sevens, you know. Maybe there'll be a trumpet goes off and the dead in Christ rise first. Maybe three days go by because we know that the, uh, the graves opened up. When Christ died on the cross, the graves were open for three days before they ever came out. That'd be pretty awesome. Imagine the graves opening up and we're like, uh, something's going on. And you, every, all the Christians start hearing these trumpets. And it's not all the medicine that you're on either. <laughs> 
And I'll call up, hey, Brother Jeff, did you hear that? <laughs> William Tell Overture. <laughs> and you hear these sounds and you know that thing's about to ring off. Man, that thing's going to happen. It's really, this stuff's really going to happen. Amen. It's just real, just pull put of wood. The trumpet's going to sound, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them. There'll be a resurrection, there'll be a rapture, there'll be a reunion, we'll see our loved ones, that'll be a blessing. And they'll be caught, we'll go up there and there'll be a rejoicing. You talk about dancing, it won't be none of this nasty, perverted garbage that's going on, dancing with the stars, man. We'll be dancing up in the stars, amen? amen. And there will be a rejoicing, we'll be running around, we'll, I can't believe this. Of course, we'll believe it. But there's always, your, there's always that, that human element of, I believe, but this is pretty far out. The morning turned into dancing. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 2 Corinthians 4, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Paul said, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Two things, and we're done. Look in verses... 10 and verse number 2. First of all, verse number 10. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. If you're having struggles being girded with gladness and having the joy of the Lord in your life, if you're more filled with complaint and complacency than you are praise, then you need to pray verse number 10. There's, there's something not right. Now, I understand everybody goes through periods. I know that when you study some of the great uh, preachers of the past, Charles Spurgeon went through a lot of periods of depression. I mean, bad periods where he just wouldn't get in the pulpit for weeks at a time. I mean, awful time. Martin Luther went through some crazy time. I mean, Christians have problems. I'm not saying you've got to walk around and you're always just on cloud nine. But I'm saying there should be a joy. There should be a gladness. There should be a contentment. There should be, can I use this word in our society now, peace. And if that's not the case, then there's some prayers that need to go up. Verse 10 is a good one. Here, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Lord, I need some help. Lord, I'm not taking these things in the right way. Lord, I'm getting offended. God ever hurts your feelings? The Lord can hurt your feelings. One of the old-time saints, I think it's Madame Guyon, she said, I'm not responsible for how God treats me. I'm responsible for how I treat Him. Right. Every way God treats you is right. Because God never makes mistakes. God is a loving God. God is a good God. He's a just God. He's a fair God. You might not understand it because you have a mind that's finite just like mine. We can't wrap around God's plan and purpose all the time. We are responsible for how we respond to Him. Thank God that even though we don't understand, even though sometimes we say some mean things or we think some mean things against God or we get embittered against God, God loves us and He pities us. He knows our frame. He says in Psalm 103, I know their frame. I know that they're just dust. He knows how feeble we are. It's kind of like little kids. Some of you ever have a little kid and you ever see them go through the angry stage? I've seen these little kids and sometimes I'm thinking, man, woo. These mamas let their little kids hit them. It's like, where did that come from? I know some of you don't allow that, but I'm just, I've seen it. You've probably seen it tell them like, you, 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 really? You gonna let a little two and three year old hit you? He might do it once. Amen. But the Lord looks at us like that, and here we are embittered, saying things we really don't mean, saying things because we're confused. We haven't been in the Bible like we should. We hadn't been in prayer like we should. We're not thinking the right kind of thoughts of God because we're not filled with the Spirit. We're filled with the flesh, and He knows that. And He loves you anyway. He'll take the abuse. He can take it. I'm telling you, he can take it. He took it on the cross. Talk about verbal abuse, man. 
How many times have we abused God? He loves you anyway. He knows you're just confused. He knows you're going through trials. Ask Him to help you, verse number 10. That's a good prayer. And then verse number 2, O oh Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Ask Him not just to be your helper, but your healer. You have this spiritual sickness, this, this depression, this madness instead of gladness, this discontentment. Ask for God to, to heal you. Stuff, this is spiritual stuff. I'm no psychologist. Don't come asking for me for a prescription. I'm a preacher. I can give you a spiritual prescription from the Bible. And this is good spiritual advice right here. God, I need help. I need healing. And wait on the Lord. You read passages like this and you think about David, all that he went through. By the way, some of the things David went through, he caused himself. And some of you, maybe you're dealing with emotional scars because of some of your own sins. Here's the great thing about forgiveness of God. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. Amen. So you know what? You might have some skeletons in the closet. You may have some sins in the past. But God forgives you for that stuff. You can get past the past. You can forget the things that are behind reaching forth into those things which are before. It's going to take some time, but God will get you through it. And then we can say, hopefully, in verse number 11, Thou hast turned from me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. <clears throat> to the end, verse 12, here's where it gets good. My glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. You know what happens? The Lord does all this. So in the end, we're able to glorify Him. The number one reason God made you is so you could glorify Him. When you let all this other stuff infect you, then it produces this melancholy spirit. It produces this spirit of discontent, this spirit of, it's a carnal spirit. And you're not able to glorify God. It's kind of a reciprocal thing. You miss out on the very reason of your existence, the reason there's an emptiness. I don't know if y'all felt it when we weren't able to have church, but there's just something wasn't right. And I'm feeling that we're having to take the hymn book at home and sing some hymns and stuff like that because, you know, you, you can't worship. And when you sing those songs, you're able to worship. There's just something missing. And if you don't have your life to where you do something for the glory of God, there's something going to be missing. But if you get sideways with him, you're not able to glorify him. And if you're not able to glorify him, you're not able to have the joy. So it goes hand in hand. So two prayers. Let's pray for God's help and let's pray for God's healing. Amen. That he might give it to us. Father, we thank you for the text. What a great passage. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that you might turn their sadness into gladness. God, that you might gird them with gladness. That the mourning could be turned into dancing and the weeping into joy. God, I pray that your anger will be turned into favor. Lord, we know that you love us, and sometimes we don't understand. Many times we don't understand what we go through. God, I just ask that you may encourage each one of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I don't know all the spiritual needs may be represented here this morning, all the sorrows, the griefs. Lord, sometimes we get dealt a blow that we just don't think we can recover from. And Lord, without your help and without your healing, we can't. And so Lord, I pray that you may restore the years that the locust hath eaten, kind of like in Joel, how all this devastation had taken place in the land and you told them that you could restore those years. God, I pray that you may do that and you may bless and just help each and every person here today. Lord, we thank you for your salvation. Thank you for conversion from sin to the Savior. Lord, what a blessing to know that we're saved. But Lord, in this growing process, there's some growing pains, and Lord, we need some help. So I pray, God, that you would be our helper. I ask that you might uh, just give us the courage and the strength that we need to make some of those decisions to spend time with you, spend time in your word. And Lord, I pray that you might reward us accordingly. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. We ask for your blessings now. Go with us. Be with our church family. Pray for these that were mentioned for prayer earlier. That you might help them, God. And we do pray for our nation. We just lift it up to you, God. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You're